the Team Performance Podcast with Spencer Horn and Christian Napier. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Team Performance Winning Ways for Uncertain Times podcast. I'm Christian Napier, delighted to be joined by the man. And is that blue or purple? I can't tell if my screen is rendering colors correctly. Yeah, it's Spencer. supposed to be blue. It's blue. And uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Spencer, it's great to see you once again. How are you doing? Great. Good to be with you. Good to see you. Well, How are I'm, you? I'm doing great, but I'm really, really excited to speak with you today because number one, we had lunch with a good friend, Patrick DDA, on Friday at one of our yes. favorite hangouts, Red Iguana, and it was absolutely delicious. And while we were there, you told us that you had some pretty interesting weekend plans. And then I saw photographic <laughs> evidence of those plans coming to fruition on Facebook. Why don't you tell us what you were doing over the weekend? Yeah, so my, my boys and I, we drove down to southern Utah. So I, I don't know if you've ever been to the, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, it's, but it's a, it's a huge region in southern uh, Utah. I mean, it, it, it abuts all the way up to um, the, uh, gosh, what is that? Canyonlands National Park, uh, Capitol Reef National Park. Lake Powell, all the way over to, it's like all, all in this area in between Bryce Canyon National Park down to, down to the Arizona border. And it's absolutely amazing. And this area that we were in is called Coyote Gulch. And it is a, it, it's, this, it's this big winding wash uh, stream that feeds into the Escalante River. And there's several ways to get into it, but it is, it is not easy. You have to get all the way down to like Escalante and then you drive and this is no exaggeration. It's 40, about 45 miles on washboard dirt roads. And that's a long way. So that takes about an hour and a half, depending on how fast you go. We were going pretty fast. Otherwise it'd take you about two hours just to do that 45 miles. And then we get to this trailhead and, um, it's called the Jacob Hamblin Trailhead. So there's a, an arch in there. It's called the Jacob Hamblin Arch and Christian. It's absolutely amazing. Basically, there's this bend in the river that goes all the way into the mountain and, and the, the, the ridge goes over top. So like you're like in a cathedral. It's 500 feet high. And we camped under that stone rock. So it wasn't just an arch. It was like it was like an alcove that was enormous. And then there's an arch at the end of it. So you've got this double arch and that's the Jacob Hamblin arch and, and we're camped on a beach and it's just amazing. So, but to get down into it, Christian, you're, um, I think you're supposed to have ropes, but my boys have been, we, we've, I've kind of taught them how to crawl on, on, oh, We've taught them how to crawl on rocks and, and cliffs, but we were with full backpacks and it was really uh, a little awkward because people were coming out and they were scared and they had a rope. And so, but what happened is, is they're blocking our way down. And so you can't stay on the cliff for very long because you just wear out. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so we had to figure out how to, you know, I had to have my sons actually help me because I'm old now. And so where to put your hands and feet because you could just slide down the mountain and um, and it's a it's like a cliff. I don't know if you saw some of the pictures. I did see some of the pictures and some of those it looked like, oh, you're walking along a riverbed and that looks not too hard. And then I see you guys coming down this uh, this rock face here. I'm like, uh, yeah, that that that's a little steep for my for my liking. Yeah, there, there's a, there's only a couple ways to get into the canyon, uh, and and some of them require ropes or a very long hike through a, a gentle wash. But once you get down into the canyon, it is amazing. You got to go. You're, you're going to get wet. I mean, you got to hike through the river. You got to cross the river because there's lots of barriers and stuff. But so after we set up camp, we hiked up and explored, and we found we went to this what's called the Coyote Natural Bridge. And the river goes right through this bridge. It's like a, an arch that, 
it's just amazing. And and then we saw, I believe they're Anasazi ruins on a you know, cliff dwelling. And it was, we went up to explore that. It was almost as hard to get up to that. I'm like, whoever lived here, they must have had ladders or something. And and so we're climbing up there and it's super dangerous <laughs> to get to, but it's just uh, the stunning scenery as you could see. Well, how long did it take you to hike into this place to, for, to the well to the place where you actually camped out? Yeah, so that it's it's only about maybe less than three mile hike to that, and so kind of getting down that that cliff part was the hardest part. It took us probably an hour and a half to get to from the trailhead. It wasn't that it wasn't that hard, but then once we got in there, we hiked for about four hours just up and down, went another six seven miles. Um, and then just stayed over one night and then climbed back out the next day. Going up the steep stuff is so much easier than going down. Yeah. Wow. It sounds amazing. And it looks to me that uh, obviously you survived. You're here uh, doing the podcast. So congratulations on surviving along with your, with your sons. It sounds like a great, great time. Yeah. We, I, I'm so glad we got to go and it's just good to, to get out and be together and, you know, met, met a few nice people while we were there. But thanks for asking. What about you? What did you do this weekend? Uh, I didn't do anything crazy like that. Uh, I had a lot of work that I had to do. And so I spent most of the weekend actually doing work stuff. I, I had a, a couple of big deliverables for the International Olympic Committee and a few other things that I needed to work on. So I spent most of my week working, weekend working, I should say. And that's okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm out of sync again, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my picture off and put the, put the slide up so our, our guests don't get confused by my, my lag. I got to figure out what's causing that with my laptop. Well, that looks like an appropriate thing to introduce us with, just given that you went on a huge hike in Red Rock Country uh, over the weekend. Why don't you tell us, now, I guess for our listeners, this is a continuation of the conversation that we had last time which was yeah. about all of the pressure and the grief that we're all feeling individually and collectively having been in this pandemic situation for a year going on more than a year now and we had a great conversation last time we wanted to wrap that conversation up today and so we're continuing on to the next uh, item here Hard that's check. right i mean it, it, and we talked about some suggestions on, on what to do thank you for that setup and and I, I think we left off with this with this topic or concept of, of hardship. And, you know, Christian, this can be a powerful catalyst for positive change. I, I started working for a leadership training and development company, uh, Rapport Leadership, in 2008. You recall, uh, I left Salt Lake back in 2006 to go to Las Vegas. And that's when I was working for this company. You and I knew each other before then when we worked for uh, the same company, but, um, well, we were, we were supporting the same company. Yes. Anyway, when I started in 2008, that's right when that, what we called back then the great recession hit. And this company hired me to do organizational development training. Well, when the recession hit, they asked me to switch to sales because their sales went from like a million dollars a month to, 800 and then 600 and, you know, 500 and 400. I mean, it just, it just dropped like a rock. The sales were just, cause this is training is one of the first things that companies cut during a recession. And, but it's one of the last things they actually should cut because those companies that continue to train, even now during this recession, when things got tight, really had an advantage over those who, who weren't able to do that. And some companies just aren't able to do that. And so it's not a knock. It's just those companies that were able to, to invest in their people to deal with the hardships were super well poised for when things turned around. So, you know, at that time, that was, it was not a good time for me to look for another job. And so I, I, you know, I started selling and, and I decided to approach sales a little bit differently than maybe some of the other salespeople. And I quickly became one of the top producers and I made more money than, than, I, than I'd ever made even though it wasn't steady, it was still hard. And I made a goal to be the CEO of that company in five years. 
and I did that in in five years in in one month. So I, you know, was was pretty close to that that goal. But it, it that this is not meant to to brag. I was actually the fourth CEO in five years, and the company had all kinds of challenges, and I I really felt like they needed to make changes. And so once again, I felt the circumstances required a different approach for our company, like I had taken to become successful at sales, than, than what the company had been doing up to this point that was causing them to continue to fail. And what's ironic about this situation is that this is a leadership training and development company. And they had a hard time with change. <laughs> They're teaching everybody else to do it, but they were struggling with doing it them, themselves. And eventually the, the changes that I suggested were rejected by the owner of the company, even though I was the CEO of the company, I, I, I didn't own the shares or any of the company. And so um, I found myself out of a job after seven and a half years. Now, the reason I tell you this story is because that was July of 2015. The very next day after I was let go, I started my company, Altium Leadership. And everything that I had learned about how to be successful, what I was teaching that company to do, I applied in my business. And I started this company with almost with like zero capital. I had an American Express card, which you have to pay off every 30 days, Christian, as you, as you know, right? And, but what the hardship that I experienced from the last recession did is it gave me confidence that I could be successful during this, this pandemic, right? It gave me confidence that I could go out and do that again, like I had done, done before. So that hardship prepared me for challenges, right? And so personal crises can provide an opportunity for individual growth, even though we're experiencing these hardships. Think about people who, for example, you know, we were talking about our families before we got on and think about people that you know who have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, I talked a little bit about my mom last session, right, who, who passed away from cancer. People who have, who have had heart disease or lo lost a limb or, you know, had a stroke and, and they wake up and they say, I have got to make changes. And I just, you know, I'm so inspired. But what was the name of that guy who was hiking? Speaking of hiking in Southern Utah, where that boulder fell on him and he had to cut his own arm off. Oh yeah, I can't remember the name of the guy, but yeah, the movie was 127 hours or something like that, right? Where he's stuck there, and uh, eventually, yes, he has to he has to cut off his own arm. You know, so here's an example of someone who, through you know, extreme hardship, he he cuts off his own arm with a pocket knife. You know, obviously it was mangled by this big boulder, but now he's this, this great inspirational speaker. I mean, he learned so much from that experience that is helpful to so many. So people make these changes to their lifestyle because of these, these hardships. And they become, in some cases, they become healthier than they've ever become or they've ever been before. They become more connected with their loved ones. They eat healthier. They become happier, you know, and, and so the same with economic crises, you know, it can cause us in our business to be more cost conscious, more careful, and it can be a catalyst for creativity. To me, the key word there is can, because there's a conscious decision that has to be made, whether you will leverage this hardship for your own gain and you will put it to good use and you will learn lessons and you will become better or you will not. I have also seen people on the other side of that equation where they have sunk into despair, they've lost hope and they just circle down the drain and it's heartbreaking to see because they just were not able to deal with the hardship that came their way. So what is it that allows certain people to take that hardship and use it for their good and others just are not able to do that and and they just fall by the wayside 
Well, I, I want to remind you of that study that we talked about last time with Martin Seligman and, and uh, Stephen Meyer. Do you remember the, the dogs that were shocked? It's the ones that had, quote unquote, learned helplessness that one third of them still were able to be resilient that they wanted to study. And that's where that the whole point of that story is that we can learn responsibility. We can learn, if you will, personal ownership. And it, 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 you, you have to decide, say, listen, I'm, I, I like to say, you know, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, sometimes that's what it takes for you to say, all right, I'm going to try something different. Instead of saying, you know, the whole world is against me, nothing's working. Um, you know, I can't win. What, what if you just tried something new? What if you just tried to get up and, and fight for yourself? And it's hard for some people because they don't have evidence that that's going to work. But I love the story of Viktor Frankl. And, I, and I'm sure you're aware of, of him, the, the Austrian psychiatrist, who was, during World War II, his entire family was put into the, the Nazi concentration camps. They were all murdered but him. And I'll come back to this in just a moment. But I love what he says. And, and to me, this is, this is part of the answer to what you're saying. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, the ability to choose one's own way. So what does that make you think of when you read that? Uh, you know, we ultimately own our agency. We talked last time about Nelson Mandela and the poem that you read. Um, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. I mean, it all kind of goes in, goes, it kind of boils down into that, right? We, we have the ability to choose and it's our responsibility to do so. Nobody Correct. And, 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 and so, and, and here's an individual that had everything, had no reason for hope or success in a Nazi concentration camp, possibly going to be murdered because, you know, he happens to be, uh, because of his faith and his, his, his Jewish, uh, you know, heritage and he started to have some thoughts and and think of some things and one of the things he did is he thought of, of, of what would it be like for me to survive this he actually started to think christian this is what this is what kind of changed things for him so here's a picture of victor he started to think you know what if I survive this and I would be in a, at a future date speaking at a conference of my peers learning or sharing the learnings I've had from this hardship. And one of the things that he realized is that he could begin to change his entire outlook just by what he focused on. And, they, you know, no matter how bad things got, the, the, the people who were torturing him, they couldn't change his thoughts. He realized that in any given set of circumstance, just like we saw, he had control over his thoughts and he became very inspirational to the other prisoners, and not only to the prisoners, but to his, his Nazi captors. Can you believe that? The people that are keeping him, you know, he's, a, he's an inspiration to them. And here's what he said, you know, in life, we, we have a, a lot of SH, right? Stuff happens, or let's call it something happens. And he says that anytime something happens, well, let's call that a stimulus, and our response to that stimulus, so between stimulus and response, there is a space so, so if you think about it, you know, the, the body physically, how our brains work, we have, you know, you prick your finger, what, what happens? It sends an electrical signal to the brain through the neurons, right? And that it's like, it takes time to travel through the body to the brain and then back and say, ouch, and have you move your finger, right? And it's milliseconds. It's almost instantaneous. But what he said is that between a stimulus and response, there is a space. And basically, it is in that space when something happens to us, somebody says something to us, somebody cuts us off on the freeway, somebody fires us. It's in that space that we have basically the freedom and power to choose our response. Nobody can control how we respond to the circumstances that we experience. And it's in the response to whatever is happening in our life that 
basically is where we grow as an individual, where our freedom is. And, and, and to me, this is the, nobody can tell me, well, I'm disadvantaged. Well, I, I have this problem. I have that problem because no one really had it worse than, than this guy. None of us have ever suffered the way he suffered. And he still has this, this whole, this whole perspective. So let me put it to you in a graphic form. So for those of you who are listening, I've got two circles. And in one circle it is the stimulus or something that happens to us. And then there is a circle that overlaps and that is our reaction. And, and the purpose of that is to demonstrate that when we react automatically to things that happen in our life. So remember when COVID came out, some of the response was, oh, it's the Chinese fault. I mean, people were blaming entire governments and, and countries and peoples. And even today there is a you know, there's there's a there's a racism that happens when we blame other people for for the current circumstances, right? So something happens like this terrible pandemic, and immediately, instead of you know taking responsibility, we say it's their fault, right? And and we react, and when you react automatically or instantly, your power to change your circumstances as as denoted in this graphic by the arrow or by the little uh, triangle, starts to get less. So in other words, we have less and less power to change our circumstances. And as a result, we believe that we have no power to change our circumstances. Because listen, if it's the government's fault, if it's a foreign government's fault, or if it's your boss's fault or your spouse's fault that you're miserable, what can you really do about it? Other than, you know, leave your spouse or, or, or nuke your enemies. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You, in other words, you you abdicate control because you say, "Well, it's it's the, I'm miserable because of my significant other," and so nothing you really does matter because it's all based on what everybody else is doing, and that way you give up power. And so, one of the things I want you to you, you and our listeners to do is just think for a moment. Where self assess? Where do you blame? Where do you allow your patterned responses? that control how you react, where do they show up? You know, when do you get stuck in anger, hurt, judgment, waiting for another to act, right? Where you shut down, you resentful, you're worrying, you're blaming, you're being a victim. Where does that, where does that show up? And I know I'm putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer, but I, I just want you to think about it. And if you have a thought, sure, share it. Uh, for me, it's not really in my nature to point fingers at others. And so usually what happens is I end up pointing fingers at myself. And sometimes uh, I can be my own worst critic. But I, but I will say that if I, feel, if I feel a lack of confidence in what I'm doing, that sometimes I will shut down because I don't, I don't, I can't really see myself at the end game. Just like you said with Viktor Frankl, he was able to see himself speaking to a group of people in a conference. He had this vision in his mind and he could see it and, and that propelled him. And sometimes I will lose that. I will lose that vision. And then I, and then I lose confidence in myself. And then I will just kind of shut down and say, well, it's not really worth putting in the time and effort to do this particular thing because I don't really see it succeeding. So why, why even try? You know, that's, that, that's a great point, uh, Christian. And, and it is, I'm, you know, I, I know you're not alone. I mean, it's happened to me as well, but I like the fact that, you know, it's good and bad that you point your fingers to yourself, right? It's never good that we, you know, that we, we put ourselves down, but at least you take responsibility. And part of that is, is based on your profile. You're not one that naturally points the fingers at others, but it can also cause us to have, to lack the confidence to take ourselves out or change some of our behavior. If we're like, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough, right? It could be kind of going back to that fixed mindset. I'm not having success. Um, but the one good thing about pointing the finger at yourself is, as we said before, if you realize that, hey, the conditions that I'm experiencing right now are temporary and, um, 
and basically fixable, then you can do something about them, right? That's what most optimists do and say, okay, well, my circumstances are, are not ideal right now, but maybe, I, you know, if I just learned a little bit more, maybe if I did some more research or some more study, or if I learned and improved my skills, then I can, I can change. And that's what Viktor Frankl is talking about is that once you realize that, that you have control to change your circumstances, whether that be, you know, becoming the better spouse and learning how to, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with the stress and challenges of your problem. And then if things don't change, of course, there are times to make a change, right? I mean, I'm not suggesting that people stay in abusive relationships or anything like that. Sometimes you have to leave those relationships. Sometimes you have to leave a company to, to be treated fairly. But I also believe, I mean, I, I did everything I could and I was asked to leave and, you know, I didn't have any control over that, but what came next, I had complete control over what am I going to do? Am I going to go back to working for somebody else? Or am I going to take ownership and start my own business, which is what I've always wanted to do. I did not do that earlier because I was afraid Christian. I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to provide for my family. I was afraid that, um, cause we had been in debt for so long since the last recession that we still didn't have savings. You know, we had just started to pay off all of our, of our debts. And so here I was in a situation where I, I, I had a choice to either go find a new job or start my own company without any real resources other than my knowledge. And my wife was behind me. And so we chose to do this because we felt confident that, you know, we've survived this hardship in the past that we could apply that knowledge and be successful. And the assets I had were knowledge and hard work. You know, you need three things to, to be successful in business. You need a, you need a good um, business plan, right? You need, a, you need financial resources, you need customers, and you need a great product. I feel like I had a great product and I had people that I knew, but I just had no capital. <laughs> so I made up for that in, in effort. But I didn't blame anybody else. I pointed the finger at me. What can I do? And so I think sometimes that's actually helpful as long as you're not uh, being defeatist and putting yourself down. And yeah, I'm no I, psychologist. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that assertion that pointing the finger at yourself can be helpful, but if you're not in the right frame of mind, it can be quite hurtful. Right. Um, so, so, so self-assess. You know, under what circumstances do you blame? Identify emotional triggers where you, you know, that that's part of increasing your emotional intelligence. What what triggers you? What frustrates you? And then let's get to what I call the ownership factor, okay? And so this is, this is still the, this principle where what, what Viktor Frankl is talking about. And in this graphic, we have on the left stimulus, which something happens, right? And, and then we have the next circle, which is our response to the stimulus. And if we hold off on our, uh, to our response to the things that are happening to us in our life, we then in that space of our response, we can start to, to, to change how we think, right? When something happens, we delay our response that will create a better outcome for us. We can choose our energy and it, it, our, our ability and power starts to grow to actually change our circumstances. We feel more fulfilled. We're at choice. Life is, is more of a game. It's joyful. It's allowing. It's outrageous. It's fun. We have more peace. We have more freedom. Even though all the same stuff is happening as it was before, we now feel like, okay, I'm conscious that this happened to me. Now, what am I going to do about it? Not, oh, it's somebody else's fault. There's nothing I can do. What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? Right? Um, what choices do I have? You and I were actually talking about, you know, the, the vaccine and all that kind of things. And there's some people that, that have questions about it. So, so what are you going to do about it? you know, how you get to, you get to study, you get to research and you have choices on how you're going to respond. And then you can, you can really utilize your passion to just solve your, solve your challenges. You can get, you know, use your creativity. And so then the power to change your circumstances grows. And that's what the, the, the arrows pointing out and growing represents. Mm -hmm. Spencer, on the last diagram that you showed us for our listeners, it was a Venn diagram. So you had a bit of overlap between stimulus and response. It was it was a small amount of overlap, but there was some overlap there. That's right. In this particular chart, 
you've got a gap between the stimulus and the response. And that gap is filled with some nice words, right? But, you know, the, the conscious choice, um, responsible, passion, creative, I think sometimes it's important for us to be able to distance ourselves a little bit from the stimulus so that we can think clearly, whether that is through meditation, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through uh, reading sacred texts or doing something that kind of takes you out of this stimulus because we're just in the rat race and we're all so busy and we're working hard and we have so many responsibilities and it's so difficult. Sometimes you just need to, you need a little time to give yourself some room where you can actually ponder some things and get some perspective. That's a hundred percent correct. And, and the, what I'm saying about the pattern responses or the overlap is that typically when somebody does, so for example, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, what's your automatic response? Jerk, call them a name. Why do we do that? Well, you know why? Because I'm Latin and we're just hot blooded. That's just how we react. Or I'm German. I have a bad temper. You know, don't, don't cross me because this is how I react when you piss me off. Sorry if I've offended anybody with that language, but so we have these automatic patterns that we just automatically respond to situations that happen to us. But here, somebody cuts you off on the freeway. And I, and I think it was um, Stephen Covey that talked about this, right? He was, he was riding on a subway. Do you remember that story? And the kids were, were misbehaving on the subway. They were just distracting everybody. And the father had his hands in his, in his uh, head. And his first thought was, how disrespectful. I mean, this, this father is just not even aware of the impact that his kids are having on all these other writers. And so Stephen reached, just said to the father, you know, excuse me, sir, you know, your kids are really bothering everybody. And the father says, oh, yes, I'm so sorry. You're right. Um, we just came from the hospital and their mother just passed away. And, um, and I guess they're just a little bit, a uh, little distracted. I, I apologize. Instantly, Stephen's, Stephen Covey said, you know, my perspective of, you know, changed and my response changed. Those kids were bothering him. That was a stimulus, right? And he, if he would have just waited and thought, what if when somebody cuts you off on the freeway, instead of giving him the one finger salute, like we usually do, what if you said, well, I wonder what's going on with them. I wonder why they're in such a hurry. What could be causing them to to do this. Maybe they're on the way to the hospital because somebody they know is um, having COVID. So instead of coming home frustrated at the terrible drivers and, and, you know, you have, you have chosen to respond differently and you're now in control of how you feel about the circumstances that you've experienced. It's that simple. Yep. So I, I want to show it to you in a, a little different, I'm going to give you a scenario, Christian, let's say that you're in a, I know you don't go to bars, neither do I, but I just want you to, for those of you who are listening, say you're in a, in a club, right? In a bar and there's music playing, everybody's dancing, they're having a good time and in walks an FBI agent. And this FBI agent still has his uniform on, but it's after hours. He's not on shift and he's getting, you know, he starts to get excited by the music. You know, he's been, it's been a long day. He starts dancing, gets so excited that he does a backflip on the dance floor so that his firearm falls out of its holster, hits the ground, and discharges and shoots you in the leg. Now, my question to you, <laughs> my question to you, Christian, is, are you lucky or unlucky? Well, you got to consider yourself lucky that it didn't hit you in the chest or in the head, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you consider yourself unlucky because you were there in the first place and you're injured, but it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, there, there's this concept called awfulizing, right? And, and some people awfulize about things that are a lot smaller than this. But if you were talking to your friends afterward about this, 70% say, you know, I, I was terrible. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I got shot in the leg. Oh my gosh. But on the other hand, some people would say, well, at least I didn't get shot in the head. At least nobody else got hurt. You know, sometimes people would say, well, what if you were a dancer and you couldn't dance, you know, after that, it could, it, it could be pretty awful. Right. But on the other hand, um, and this, and I give you this scenario 
this really happened. Do you remember this happening? It happened in Denver and it was a bar and an FBI agent after hours went in and in his gun shot somebody in the leg. And it's pretty funny because the person who, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's funny, but the person who got shot was given drinks for life by the bar for, uh, <laughs> for having suffered through those, those hardships. But it's, it, you know, you have a choice of how you're going to think about the bad things that, that happened to you. So I, I want to talk to you about this, this idea of the ownership factor. And here's another statement by Viktor Frankl. I love this. And, and I'm just using, you know, his, his thoughts. And that is when we can no longer change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. You know, I, I haven't always made great decisions and I, I've done my best to take responsibility or accept responsibility and learn from my mistakes. You know, at, at one part in, in my life, at one point in my life, I started a business, not recently, um, but I started my business without having done really a lot of due diligence. And, and my wife had advised me to, to you know, to, to not do it. And, and she was ultimately right. But I went ahead and, and did it anyway. And four years later, Christian, um, we had depleted our savings and our home was in foreclosure. And I was actually working with our friend Christ, uh, uh, Christian uh, Patrick to, uh, to purchase it. I don't know if I've ever told you that. No, no, not heard that story. I don't know if Patrick even remembers that. It was, it was many, many years ago. And... Um, Ultimately, we had to give the, the house back to the bank. You know, it was devastating to us. And, but I had to stop and say, you know, it wasn't the government's fault. It wasn't the companies that I, you know, I was, that I was working with's fault. Um, it was mine. And I just, I, I, I changed directions with my business. I found, we found a nice rental house and life continued. And it was, you know, it wasn't the bank or the government that caused it, it was the consequences of my choices in action. And, you know, I, I've, I've been kind of on people's case on this podcast about taking ownership for responsibilities. Listen, lots of bad things have happened to me. Lost a mother to cancer. My father had a stroke and, and lost too young. I've, I've failed in business. I've lost a home. There's, I've, I've, I've had lots of failures. And so when I'm, when I'm making these suggestions, this is not just PMA, you know, positive mental attitude stuff. It, it really works. When, when, when we choose to do nothing, nothing will really change. But when we say, Hey, I get to work on me, I get to make better decisions. Then those experiences that we have can be for our benefit, for our learning, for our growth. You know, if you study the most successful people, you're going to see a, a similar pattern. Think about Michael Jordan being cut from his high school team as, you know, as a senior. Think of Walt Disney being fired by his newspaper editor for not being creative enough. You know, think of the Beatles who were rejected by a record executive who said guitar groups are on their way, on their way out. You know, what, what, did you see that show with, uh, uh, about um, Queen when they wrote Bohemian Rhapsody and, and the agent was just like, are you kidding me? A, a rock opera? That, that'll that never fly or never work. And he rejected that idea. And they were just like, dude, you're, you're nuts. And it's one of the most popular songs in, in history. So, you know, Michael Jordan says, I've failed over and over again in my life. That is why I've succeeded. And Kennedy, Robert Kennedy said, only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. And Thomas Edison said, he failed his way to success. So those are some examples of, of what I'm talking about, right? Well, we had examples on our podcast. Scott Hamilton was on here a month ago talking about how he fell. It was an estimated by someone who was working with Scott. It was estimated that he, that he has fallen on the ice like 41,600 times. But he's gotten up 41,601 times, right? He just keeps getting up. And so uh, we, we know this from from elite athletes uh they they fail they fail a lot 
we we've seen it. I mean, Jordan, you mentioned Jordan. He it took him seven years, you know, to win his first NBA championship. He struggled getting past the Detroit Pistons in the Eastern Conference <laughs> Finals, and you know they were uh, they were Great his nemesis, and and they they played him very very physically, but eventually he overcame it. And 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 you know Scott again, he did participate in some early nationals competitions, fell yep. a bunch of times, didn't place, but learn from his mistakes. It's, well, it happens. That, yeah, we that, that's right. So I, I want to give you this, this, what I call the ownership factor, or, you know, it's a, it's a personal power model. So I want you to think of a real life scenario that generates maybe negative emotions or thoughts. And maybe, or, or think of a situation in your life, if you're listening to this, that didn't have a positive outcome. And, and a lot of times when I work with, you know, workshops, or if I'm giving a, a speech on this, I, you know, I have them write down what are some things that, that, that you failed at or didn't turn out the way you want. And I, or I actually have them get up and, and walk through, this is what I have them walk through this, what I'm going to talk about to you. And I put a little, uh, I put little squares on the floor with, with, with these sayings. First of all, something happens. And so that's what they've just written down. Uh, uh, something that's happened that has caused you to fail or be frustrated or have negative emotions. And next, what you do is you, you think about what are the thoughts and the self-talk that happen. And so you gave me an example a minute ago, you point the finger at yourself. Maybe some of the things that you say to yourself are, um, you know, you, you put yourself down and say, I'm so this, or I'm so that, right? And you have this self-talk. Well, what does that lead? That leads to attitudes, feelings, and emotions that many times are powerless, right? Because I am I am not smart enough or because I'm stupid, you know, I can't believe I did that. How many times have you ever said that? I'm so stupid. I can't believe I, I did that. And so as a result, what are the attitudes and feelings? A lot of times they are, they're negative. And, and as a result, the actions are, oh gosh, I just... I can't do anything about it. And, and as a result, the outcomes and the results that we experience are not what we want. So then what I have the, you know, participants do is I go back. And so, so think about that exact same scenario. This time, I want you to change the self-talk, the story, the thoughts. What are you thinking about that? Change the story you're telling yourself. You know, maybe it is that, that that's unfortunate and there's more that I could learn, or there's some, there, there's, there's a reason why this happened and it's, it's temporary and fixable. Right. And as a result of that, you're like, all of a sudden you have more hope, you have more positive emotions. And well, maybe that this is something that I can, I, I have control over. And as a result, you start to do something differently than what you've done in the past, or you take action where you didn't in the past. And as a result, you have a different outcome. Right. And, and so Michael Jordan, you take that example of where he failed again. So they played him physical. What did he learn to do? He learned to be more physical. You think of Scott Hamilton and he lost because there was part of his routine. I can't remember the, you know, the, the compulsory um, figures, right? That was one of his weakest areas. He, he said, all right, I have control over that. I'm going to, I'm going to start to learn to love those. Even those are, those things aren't not my favorite. I'm going to start changing my attitude towards that. I'm going to love that part of this. And he started spending more time on it and it became one of his strengths and he won. That's an exact example of how you would apply this ownership factor. I've seen this in my life on both sides <laughs> so much, you know, there'll be situations where I'm doing a piece of work for a client or something and I run into a particularly rough stretch. Sometimes it's hard and, or, you know, maybe, maybe I didn't, I, I did the work and then the client was just kind of eh, about it, you know, it wasn't super or shattering or anything. And I didn't, I didn't get the reaction that I was expecting. And so what happens in these situations, I do have that self-talk. And, and for me, the behavior that manifests is I do things to distract myself so that I am not feeling that emotion that I don't want to feel, whether that's just, okay, well, I'm going to sit here and listen to music that I like, or I'm going to watch something on YouTube or something, or I'm going to read 
something online and it's just a distraction and it's a non-productive distraction. I don't get anything done. Right. And then I realized, you know what? I just wasted five hours on doing nothing <laughs> and I'm not any better off. And, 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 and it can be, it can be quite unproductive taking that path. Whereas what you said, the other path is all right. Yep. That was, that was rough. Let me try this again. Let me do this a different way. Uh, you know, the as if model that you've talked about previously, you know, act as if you're the CEO, you're of a Fortune 500 company, or act as if you're a healthy person, or act as if you're a good husband or father, has really mattered to me. That's that's been impactful for me over the last several months as we've been doing these podcasts. I take well, a step back and ask myself, okay, well, how would a healthy person act in this situation? How would a successful individual, how would a good father act in this situation? I've been asking myself these questions consciously uh, since, since you taught that technique or we've had guests talk about that. Um, and it's really, really made a difference in the, the, the squares that you're talking about or the paths that you're talking about. When you have that self-thought and self-reflection, just ask myself that question. Well, what would, what would a successful CEO do in this situation? Well, love that. This. That's actually okay, that's the, the path I'm going to choose. So, so that's one of the strategies of this process. But it, you, and you you've cut us that that's great. That's next. But um, I, I I'm so glad you brought that up. But I love this saying, and I want you to read it and tell me what comes to mind. Our happiness has less to do with how much actual control we have in our life and more to do with how much control we think we have. So what does that mean, do you think? That's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to interpret it. Because... Stop. Go ahead. Because... Um, uh, do we want to operate under an illusion? Or do we want to say, actually, um, we think we have control. We may not actually have control. I, walk me through it, Spencer. So, so think about how much control we actually have right now over the economy, over the over getting sick with with with, with COVID. And so, some people can say, you know what, I'm I'm miserable because of all the circumstances that are around me because I can't do anything about it. Your happiness is is less to do with with what's going on around you and has more to do with the choices that you make. Because if I say, okay, I get it. I can not change the fact that there's, you know, that I'm stressed and I'm, I'm frustrated, but I can do something different. What can I do? I can learn to get healthier. I can learn to eat healthier. I can go outside and exercise. I can do something. And because I think I have control, I take the approach that I now am going to do something versus abdicate control. Because my happiness is not dependent on the environment. It's not dependent on others. It's dependent upon what I choose to do with my time, with my, with my resources, with my challenges. And when I think that I have the ability to do something, I will actually take action and therefore will, will create different outcomes in my life. I will change my circumstances. And that's where happiness comes is from taking action and taking ownership and using that agency that we've been talking about. I think it's important for our listeners to understand that if they are not feeling happy at the moment, that that doesn't mean that they're bad people or they failed. You know, it's okay. It's okay to feel a range of emotions, right? But don't let that deter you from what you ultimately want to become, you know? It's okay you know, I, to I, grieve the loss of loved ones. It's okay to, to feel upset because your business has gone kaput. Uh, you know, it's, it, those are natural things to feel, but um, try to take that and turn it into something good. Well, yeah. let, me give you, let me give you another example. I, I hope these stories are okay. I know we're going a little bit long, but this is, this is a principle I learned from ancient Greek history. And when I started my business, 
I, I wanted to ensure that I took the, this ownership factor to heart. I wanted to, to take control over my life. And I keep putting pictures up because I'm out of sync. That's why I'm doing that. And, and you just have to deal with it. Those of you who are watching, I apologize. But there was a, the leader of, of the Greek city, Athens. At the time uh, of um, the leader, Themistocles, Greek, what, Greece was not a unified country. I mean, you had Macedonia, you had Sparta, you had Athens, you had all the probably 60 different city states were, were making up what, what was called the Greek people, right? And at the time, you've heard of maybe the, the Persian king Xerxes was conquering, you know, the whole world, it seemed like at the time, and, and he was coming west, and he was conquering, uh, you know, the Greeks and, and so many other people. But uh, you know, we, we recall that story when when he uh, was getting ready to march up through Athens, he had to go through Sparta. And there was, there was this um, little narrow pass where the 300 Spartans stopped like a million man army, right? And they like for a whole day and it, and it delayed the, the escape of, of the other Greeks. Well, Themistocles knew that that Athens could never stand to Xerxes. And so he abandoned the city, took his, his armies, and they got all the Greeks onto ships because they figured they might have a better chance of fighting Xerxes on, on their ships. Well, the problem was is that some of the Greeks were like, this is in our fight, you know, he hasn't come to, to our place yet. So they were getting ready to run away. Well, what choice did Themistocles have? You know, did he want to stand against <laughs> um, Xerxes on, on his own? He wanted to keep them united. So he wanted to create a scenario where we had to stay fighting to keep his people fighting. So he sent a spy to Xerxes. He said, listen, we happen to have our entire Navy, all these different Navy are, are trapped basically in a strait. If you send your ships on either end of the strait, you can defeat us. You can defeat the Greeks. Why would he do that? I don't know. To give them no option but to fight. Sometimes we have to create mentally a, a scenario where we're not going to give up, right? Where, where, where there's no surrender. I was so tired of working for someone else. I mentally said, I am never going to take another job. And I basically said, all right, I want to, I want to I, I, I make sure I block all my escapes. And that's what Themistocles did. And so Xerxes, sure enough, took his, his ships. That seems sound strategy, blocked off all those, those escapes. But what happened was, is that the Greeks were fighting for their families. They were great on ships and, and they were outnumbered two to one, but they defeated Xerxes because they had a vision of, for what they were fighting for. They had a purpose for what they were fighting for. And sometimes, like you said, we lose that purpose. We lose that vision of what, what it is we're fighting for that gets us up and, and causes us to, to fight for something maybe greater than ourselves. And I think during these challenging times, what is that? What is it that you're fighting for, for your business, for your family, for your life? Is it just to get through the day? Or is there something more that you want to achieve? There's something better that you want to have happen, uh, uh, something better in your life. And if you can, you know, just cause yourself to, to say, you know, what, I can change my circumstances if I take control of the circumstances and, and knowing your own personality what can you do to to prevent that from from taking over right that the, the fear of the greeks was they you know they wanted to run away so themistocles figured out how to take that that fear away <laughs> and say you're gonna fight um i don't know if that makes sense but i love that story well it does because sometimes you're in a situation where you're like i don't know how i'm gonna pay my bills you you work very very hard uh and do just about anything you can i my grandfather is a huge hero to me he, he was not highly educated, just had a high school diploma. He was an intelligent guy. He was smart. Um, but he worked very, very hard as a tradesman. You know, he painted homes. He was a carpenter, uh, a, you know, re remodeled. I worked for him when I was young, when I was like a teenager growing up, going through junior high and high school. And I didn't really enjoy working for him at the time. But I look back and think, you know, that guy was in his late 60s. He, he didn't have money. But if he didn't work, I mean, 
his wife, my grandmother, wasn't going to be eating. And he had, he had other family members that were dependent on him to a certain extent. And he just got up every day and did the work. Yeah. He worked very, very hard until he physically was not able to really work anymore. I mean, he worked up until his 80s, you know. Oh, he was my. doing this kind of work. And uh, he, he toiled. And I use that word uh, on purpose. He toiled. Uh, it was very, very hard physical labor that he did. Yeah. And uh, he was a huge example to me of, Love that. of working very, very hard. You know, and, and, but but the, but he you know he wasn't allowing the circumstances to to defeat him and you know I, I want to wrap up because we got a little long but I have just a few more things you talked about act act as if there's there's this concept of creating an alter ego some people say you know I'm just I'm just not that type of person where I can go out and conquer my fears and you know there's a there's this uh, story that Beyonce told to, if you guys know who Beyonce is, she was on Oprah Winfrey uh, several years ago. And she says, you know, I have a very strict Christian upbringing. And so it was very hard for me to get out on the stage and perform the way I do. But she created this alter ego called Sasha Fierce, <laughs> that she actually steps into this persona to get on the stage. And there's a time where you can actually step into this persona of confidence. Even if you are not naturally a person confident, you act as if you are that CEO, like you said. And then you can step back out of that if you want. And, and just realize that, you know, you are not to uh, the sum of all your weaker parts, right? You, but you have some great strengths, but you also have weaknesses. We all do. But focus on those, those things that you can you can do to change your circumstances by just um, acting as if somebody who would do that would be, would be acting. And it's, and it's a great strategy and it's, it's um, it's a little uncomfortable, but it's, you'll learn that you can have success when you do that. Um, I, I, I want to share, I'm not going to share this video because we're out of sync, but there's a, there's a video I love. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of Clark Kent, right? He's got that alter ego. Uh, you know, he's Superman, but, he shows up as that, you know, I, I, I want to be that Superman, but sometimes I feel like I'm Clark Kent, right? Nothing goes my way. <laughs> but um, one of my favorite Marvel movie scenes was from the first Iron Man. And um, you recall he's, he's making that, that suit and he puts it on, he's talking to Jarvis and they're doing testing. He's like, let's go take it out for a spin. And Jarvis is like, that's not a good idea. And, and what is, what is, uh, Iron Man say what you know uh, Tony Stark he says sometimes you got to run before you can walk sometimes you've got to run before you can walk and sometimes that's a principle that's really hard for people go out there fall on your face learn from experiences learn from failure and like we've been talking about and find out what what works and during these challenging times you know we're having to do new things we're having to experiment so so fail forward fail fast and uh, you know, follow Tony Stark. Well, Tony Stark died. I don't know if I want to follow him, but <laughs> just yeah. Kidding. But he, but he was killed by Thanos. That wasn't his fault. Well, he was killed by the Infinity Stones. He wasn't killed by Thanos. I mean, he 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 did the snap right uh, and saved uh, half of all the life in the universe. But um, well, actually, that's not true. He he did kill Thanos, right? Because he he snapped Thanos and his minions away that's right I yeah it, it, the movie straight okay. <laughs> but the last the last suggestion is this so all of the stuff that we've been talking about assumes you have the power to to change your circumstances by by your thoughts not every circumstance or every problem can be solved by these suggestions and, and i recognize that sometimes we need extra help and that's where corporate wellness and and professional uh mental health professionals can come in you know they can help with interventions in, in terms of grief and other losses and and you know according to the uh, april 2018 article in the journal of occupation environmental medicine uh, treatment of depression for depression led to 86 percent of employees better work performance and lower absenteeism and there's other research that says corporate wellness can include all kinds of stress reduction, healthy lifestyle coaching, as well as mental health professional access. And these are things that I think are, are very, very important for us to consider, not just 
those other ideas. I wanted to, to let you know that we do have some control over our lives, but sometimes we need, we need, a, we need a little extra help. Would you read this, Christian? The problems we face today cannot be solved by the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So what, what comes to mind when you read that? Uh, <laughs> well, there's, there's, there are a couple of things that come to mind. Um, number one is that quote implies that um, the problems that we have sometimes are of our own making. <laughs> right. And, and um, the thinking that was going through our minds when we created that problem cannot be the thinking that will get us out. It will just continue to bury us. And so we have to change our mindset we, That's right. in order to solve the problems that we're currently facing. Yes, there's a correlation between our thinking and the problems we're experiencing. And so we, that's part of what we've been talking about is, is change, change the story, change the thinking. As a result, you'll change your outcomes. So I, I, I've in over these two sessions, I've given you six suggestions to deal with, with grief and stress and the challenges that have caused us to be, you know, less productive, less engaged at work. And those are, you know, have fun, look for the humor, change the questions, the kinds of questions that you're asking instead of why me, you know, what can I do? What can I learn? How can I approach this differently? We talked about how in, incre increasing your gratitude and focusing on those things can really have a, a, a positive mental uh, power over you. And, and we talked about learned optimism and, and the benefits of of, of changing our mindset and, and being more optimistic and acting as if as it, that you so eloquently described and then corporate wellness. We are climbing mountains every day and we have a choice as our, as our friend, Nicole Kalkowski said, remember she says, you know, you've got a mountain in front of you. You have a choice. You can sit down and, and give up or you can climb. And climbing takes effort, just like you said, your grandfather was uh, someone who inspired you. I love climbing mountains. It's hard for me. I am not very physically fit. Doing those challenges like I did this weekend and climbing mountains like this picture shows is the top of Mount Timpanogos. I still have bruises on my, my toenails from last August. And it's, <laughs> you know, and my toenails are, are growing out. They, you know, they, they die just from the pressure of coming down that mountain. Um, <laughs> so, but gosh, was it awesome to be at the top? And, um, and that's kind of what I want to leave our listeners with is that we have a choice. We can climb those mountains. And when you get to the top, the view is amazing. And the, the happiness and the, you know, the confidence that you have is, is so empowering. So I, I encourage you to continue to climb. Well, I appreciate that encouragement, Spencer. I appreciate you coming on here every week or so and giving us a little bit of your knowledge and your wisdom and experience that you've learned through many means, academic study, school of hard knocks, <laughs> hard won experience. I really appreciate it. Now, if our listeners, if they want to learn more about how you could potentially help them in whatever Perform, team performance areas, uh, individual coaching, organizational development, or they just want to get to know you a little bit better. What's the best way for them to reach out and connect with you? You know, the, thank you. You can email me at spencer at altiumleadership.com. That's A-L-T-I-U-M. And the name actually implies climbing. If you look at my logo, it's basically a little mountain. And that's, you know, reaching the top is what it's all about. And uh, so Altium is highest, right? And so altiumleadership.com, you can go to my website and, and message me there. And Christian, um, you know, I, I know I've dominated a little bit of the conversation lately. You have so much to offer, so much to give. How do people reach you for all the things you're doing with your life stories revered, with your, your consulting and your... Uh, I know you're doing so much that the IOC just depends upon you for. How, how can others learn more about that? Uh, well, you can go to my website, gp4.com. That's gpfour.com. Look me up on LinkedIn, Christian Napier, or email me at cnapier at gp4.com. 
Spencer, as always, it's an honor to be with you. I really appreciate the time. Listeners and viewers, please like and subscribe to our podcast and we'll catch you again soon. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you.